Good afternoon, everybody. What a pleasure to be here today for the third lecture. It's Tuesday, November 22nd, for this mini course on contraction theory and its application that, that I'm teaching here at the Scuola Superiore Meridionale in Napoli. Um, wonderful. So, um, during the first two lectures, we have seen a number of theoretical concepts. Um, and today, instead, I would like to start with an application. And uh, I would like to um, write down some equations for a specific system that I think it's interesting, and um, then work with you step-by-step step in applying this contraction theory to the analysis of this particular system. So let me start with a broad motivation for my interest in uh, neural networks. So, Exactly 10 years ago, um, a breakthrough uh, happened in machine learning with the design of the AlexNet network. This is a computational approach to the solution of classification problems. It's an artificial neural network. It's a deep network, meaning to say the architecture is composed of multiple layers, and it was trained with a very simple training algorithm typically stochastic gradient descent with momentum over a very large data set run over a very powerful cluster of computers. And it was a breakthrough in the accuracy of the resulting classification task. So that was the breakthrough that made it obvious that we needed to study deep networks and, and, and so forth. This is a picture. Five years ago, people were able to sequence the genome of C. elegans, which is one of the simplest multicellular organism that has a connectome, that has a neural circuit. This particular picture here is from a, from a, from a paper by, by, I believe I have it here, by Jan, Vertes, Kotler, and so forth, right here at the reference. And this particular picture is a picture of the connectome, which is to say, collection of all neurons and all interconnections, synaptic interconnections among them. So as you contemplate these two colorful pictures, um, the point of me presenting them is to show you how different these two architectures are. The one on the left is a fit forward architecture and the one on the right is clearly not fit forward. Hmm? It's an architecture that contains plenty of um, even if you were to you know, assume it's, it's, it has a preferred directionality from sensory inputs to actuations at the output, uh, it has multiple, even if you were to find a way of layering the nodes, there would be lateral connections between layers and feedback connections from later layers all the way back to the earlier layers. I would just argue it's a generic topology this particular paper studies some of the topology in that, in that, in that uh, uh, some of the topological properties of that particular structure. Now, as, as dynamical systems control and optimization scientists, what we might be interested in is understanding the dynamics and the functionality of neural networks. Hmm? So, um, this was designed to have a certain function and it has limited dynamics in the sense that given an input, the output is computed in a fit forward fashion in a straightforward direct manner. But on the right, how to com comprehend the functionality is, is a bit more complex. Hmm? And how to comprehend the dynamics and the functionality is both a bit more complex. So one very basic requirement that you would want to impose in your study is the desire to design desire to obtain a model that gives you reproducible behavior. You know, of course, there would be some noise and so forth, but fundamentally, you would like to understand that if you apply a stimulus to this network it should respond in a relatively reliable manner. You certainly don't want chaotic dynamics or unbounded evolutions and so on and so forth, right? You would like there to be some reliability. Hmm? Maybe you want some robust behavior in the face of uncertain stimuli and you know, in your uncertainty in determining the dynamics in there. 
And as we progress, you, you want to go to this concept of functional behavior. In other words, the network is executing functions. It's not just in existence for its own sake. There is a purpose that it's executed. So how do I use contraction theory to uh, begin to capture some of these concepts? Now, in this second slide, I have a very simple preliminary mathematization of these, of these issues. What do I mean by that? Let's write down some equations and start to think about the issues that I have outlined so far. Hmm? So here I have two pictures, just like the ones before, right? The picture on the left is a feed-forward neural network. The picture on the right is, I will refer to as an implicit or a recurrent neural network. And I will explain what I mean by these words in a second. So what is a feed-forward neural network? Well, simply mean to say that the topology is composed of multiple layers, each of which is described by a very simple um, uh, equation that relates the state, the hidden state X. We have an input U, an output Y, and hidden states X. Each layer um, uh, determines for you how the state at the following layer depends upon the state at the prior layer. So here we go from I to I plus one. Hmm? So that's fine, right? You know, the, the, you're given an input, maybe you use that as the state of the zeroth layer, and then you repeatedly iterate this combination of, what do you have here? Um, let's not worry too much about the offsets. I'm not gonna talk about them any longer. Um, it's essentially a linear map and a non-linear map because W is gonna be a matrix and phi is gonna be something called an activation function. But then you realize that it's linear, nonlinear, linear, nonlinear, non and so forth, right? Because you have multiple layers. So it's the interleaving of linear maps followed by um, activation functions. I'm gonna show you some examples of activation functions shortly. Let's just say that a typical activation function, maybe it's a sigmoid, something that is you know, relatively well behaved, it's it's perhaps bounded. It doesn't have. It has a bounded derivative, monotonically increasing, and so forth. On the right, I have an implicit equation that determines the behavior from the input u to the output y, and the implicit equation involves the va a value or the value for the hidden variable X, for the hidden uh, states of the neural network X. It's called, I mean, it's called hidden because you, you, know, you, you apply an input, you observe an output, and there are other states that are not directly measurable, perhaps. Um, this is an equilibrium equation, right? This is an equilibrium equation that may or may not be well posed. It may have no solutions. Hmm? There's the input, there's a bias. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that. And then if it's true that a, a, a hidden a, a value of X can be computed, then there is a very simple linear readout equation to obtain the output. So why is this, this is called implicit. Why am I calling that an implicit neural network? Because of the reason that this equation star is implicit. X appears both on the left and on the right hand side. So it's an implicit equation in X. Why, why do I also use the word recurrent? Well, that's because in literature on neural networks, there is a thriving literature on continuous time recurrent neural networks. And the basic equation in continuous time recurrent neural networks, well, there's a couple of slight variations of it, but for example, it could be something like that. So this equation double star is an example of a continuous time recurrent neural network. And I hope you immediately see that if this equation has an equilibrium point where x dot is zero, if I set the left hand side to zero, then of course the equilibrium of the recurrent neural network is identical to the implicit, to the, to the solution of the implicit neural network problem. Does that make sense? 
So then now comes this two meaning, right? Either you think of this as a static map, and I'm, maybe I'll call that implicit, or I think of that as a as an ODE, as an ordinary differential equation, and then maybe I recall I call it I refer to it as a recurrent neural network. Now. The dynamic interpretation makes a lot of sense because the reality is that um, you know the, the, the real biological system it's described by ordinary differential equations. Quantities vary with time. The input varies with time. The hidden state varies with time, and so on and so forth. So it's all a function of time, and it makes sense to assume really what happens is that I, I do have a dynamical set of equations that are going to be solved. The solutions may may very quickly converge to the equilibrium, hmm? but, but still it's really more properly treated as dynamic. All right, so now, but then again, the functionality may well be the asymptotic one. So in other words, I, you know, I really want the input output map from U to Y to determine what the network is doing. Hmm? So maybe have a little, a, a short transient and then the input output map tells you the behavior. All right, perfect. So what is my aim? Hmm? My aim is the following. So, okay, we, we just said that this architecture in deep neural network has received an exponentially growing amount of attention in the last 10 years. And yet, it's clear that biological systems are much more properly described by implicit and more recurrent architectures. And so at a very high level, one argument is, well, Okay, we've understood a lot in the last 10 years about what can be done with feed forward architecture. I, I argue that there is value and interest in now shifting our, at least part of our attention and also understanding implicit architecture, understanding how expressive they are, understanding how they function, train them, use them in engineering applications as well. Hmm? All right, so, in order to make sense of these implicit models, there are a few basic questions that somebody may ask oneself. So you may ask yourself, is the static model well posed? Does there exist a solution to this equilibrium? Plan? A unique solution. I don't want to have zero solution or infinite number or, or fine. I, I, I want to make sure that if you apply an input U, you obtain a well-defined output Y. With the, with the understanding that there would be some noise and other things, but still. But even more realistically, I realized that perhaps I should really be using model two. So is the model two well-posed? Under what condition does model two guarantee convergence to the unique equilibrium that I established in point one? What, under what conditions for example, on the synaptic matrix W. So the matrix of coefficients are referred to as the synaptic matrices with the synaptic interconnections between the neurons. And how would I want to study implicit models if I am teaching you the basics of contraction theory? Well, unsurprisingly, I hope, uh, I would like to ensure that my neural network has highly ordered transient and asymptotic behavior um, and, and later on, maybe tomorrow, I will have a chance to talk about this at that point. And so, in other words, I would like to study dynamics that are extremely well posed as, as uh, illustrated in this picture here on the bottom right. Hmm? So, can I write down, well, I already did, ordinary differential equations and ensure that uh, um, given some conditions on the synaptic matrix, the behavior is that of a strongly contracting uh, dynamical system. Hmm. All right, so let me take, uh, let me go back to the book from the introductory slides. So these slides are on my website right now and the book is as well. So let me go back to the book and let's do some calculations. So today I'm gonna move around in the book. Let's see if I can do that efficiently. Um, and we'll go like this. So this is an example from chapter three. You may recall yesterday that we had reached more or less the middle of chapter two. So there are people, there's gonna be some going back and forth, but hopefully you guys can follow it. So first of all, what do I wanna start with? Uh, you should know that there are essentially, well, there's a number of, but here I'm presenting two standard or continuous time recurrent neural networks. Um, 
Here I've removed the biases and I've changed the B matrix. Don't worry, it's not important. Uh, one is called the firing rate model and the other is called the Hopfield model. They have the feature that here, whether I use W or A for synaptic matrix, it's irrelevant. That again, um, there is a nonlinearity and a synaptic matrix, and it's just a matter of the order in which the two are interleaved. All right. So these models, both of them, um, Hopfield wrote his uh, landmark papers in 1982. Two other scientists, Cohen and Grossberg, wrote very similar models years before. But then again, in fact, the original models of neural networks go back to the 50s and the 40s. So we can have a discussion about history later on. So these are relatively widely accepted. You find these models also, uh, the, the beautiful aspect of these models is that you find these, these models both adopted by machine learning scientists and also adopted by computational neuroscientists. So they're a happy medium. They're not nowhere near biologically fully realistic. In, in computational neuroscience books, you see much more realistic models, but they're also connected with machine learning. Hmm? All right, so now, A is the synaptic matrix, U is an input, phi is a diagonal map. What I mean by that is that phi of x, where x is a vector and phi is a vector, is just a phi one of x1, phi two of x2, phi three of x3, all the way to phi n of xn. Hmm? And one of the features of such a phi because it's diagonal is that if you were to compute the Jacobian of phi, um, then it, it would be uh, it would be something like phi one prime of x one, phi two prime with respect to x two, all the way to phi n prime of x n. So saying that your activation function is diagonal is a diagonal nonlinearity. Um, um, it's it's equivalent to saying that it's a diagonal matrix. The Jacobian is a diagonal matrix, and each and the i i entry is just a function of the i th pair. All right. Um, and one important feature of the Hopfield neural network is that it is possible to implement it in analog circuits. This has given rise to a rich literature on the study of Hopfield circuits for the solution of optimization problems. So I, I'm not gonna talk about it. There's a picture here, you, you, you know, may be familiar with that. I do believe to some extent, the firing rate model is more biologically plausible than the Hopfield model, in my opinion. For one reason, if you happen to select activation functions that are non-negative, meaning to say they only take non-negative values, then one can show that the model, that the second model, the firing rate model, compared with the Hopfield model, is a positive system. The firing rate model is a positive system. A positive system is a system with the property that if you start with the initial conditions in the positive orthant, you remain in the positive orthant. And in biology, biological activation levels of neurons, it's typically, for example, the firing rate, and the firing rate would have to be non-negative. So um, if, you, if you take a biological point of view, I've read papers where people would argue quantities need to be non-negative. The Hopfield model has the advantage. It can be implemented in a, in a circuit, as I was mentioning. All right. What do these activations look like? What are examples? There are many examples. Um, typical examples are sigmoidal activation functions such as the hyperbolic tangent. But I have also seen examples where the sigmoid um, is always is non negative, and maybe the, the place where it quickly transitions from the minimum to a maximum value is not necessarily centered around zero. ReLU, the rectified linear unit here on the right, is another classic activation function. It's zero for negative values and it's positive. But I have seen many variations where people, for example, study the leaky ReLU, which is an epsilon angular coefficient and then an angular coefficient equal to one. 
I've seen the saturated versions of Relu where it's flat, it grows flat. I have seen, you know, number number of variations of that. Another one is the is the is the soft threshold, something that looks like like linear growth, a dead zone, and linear growth. Hmm? A, a common set of assumptions that captures all of these models is to assume that the, the, the activation functions are weakly increasing and they are slope restricted or non-expansive in the sense that um, the derivative is upper bounded by one. Hmm? Now, I don't even need the differentiability. In fact, some of these examples are not everywhere differentiable. It's entirely fine that if they are almost everywhere differentiable and the derivative that continues and the derivative satisfies that condition almost everywhere. So the derivative is at most one, almost everywhere, wherever the function is differentiable. So in other words, you could replace this condition with the Lipschitz condition. With the Lipschitz constant, which is uh, less than equal than one. Weakly increasing, though, is very common. I have seen examples of interesting neural circuits where, in fact, the activation function is not weakly increasing, but that's more like the exception to the rule. Most of most of the science studies in the literature assume weakly increasing activation functions. All right. Also, the derivative of the activation function could be larger than one, but if you go back to the models and you think about it for a minute, it's always possible if the derivative of the function is larger, of phi is larger than one, to simply rescale the activation function and absorb the scaling coefficient in the synaptic matrix A in such a way that the derivative is at most one. Okay. So now, what do we want to do to prove contractivity? What do we want to do to prove contractivity? You may recall that we, in the first lecture, we said that the vector field F is strongly infinitesimally Contracting, given a norm, you need to have a norm with respect to a norm. Hmm? You need to have a norm. This norm gives rise to a log norm, mu. Hmm? If the following condition is true, the supremum over all axes of the log norm of the Jacobian of f of x is less than equal to minus c, where c is a positive number and c is called the contraction rate. So this is this I, I stated during lecture number one. Static. Yeah. Pardon? Static. 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 What, what do you mean by static? Doesn't it do that time? Right, yes, this vector field is a static, the time independent, and also input independent. If instead you have that, what do you may have? You may have that the vector field depends also upon, maybe it depends also upon an input u, for example, and u could be time itself. Then this equation must hold for all u uniformly in u or uniformly in time, uniformly in whatever parameters you may be interested in. Hmm? Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so let's work with, oh, sorry, let me just check. Let's work on the firing rate model. We just said that it's something of the form minus X plus P, Synaptic matrix X plus U. Hmm? Any questions? This is just copied from the previous slide. And so my task now, remember when you read this formula, there are three parts. It's the Jacobian log norm supremum. Hmm? What do you take the supremum of the log norm of the Jacobian? Hmm? So let's start by computing the Jacobian and then we'll remember what the log norm is. 
So the Jacobian here, it's very simple, right? U F R. It'll be a function of both X and U. Sometimes when I want to be very careful, this is the Jacobian with respect to X. Because of course you could take the Jacobian with respect, you could take partial derivative with respect to U. But no, here we mean to say, when I say the Jacobian, I mean to say with respect to the state variable, right? So what am I obtaining, obtaining here? Obviously, the first term gives rise to minus the identity matrix. Um, then, of course, I have the Jacobian of phi, right? I have the Jacobian of phi evaluated at ax plus u, and then I need to take the Jacobian of the argument of phi, which will give me the matrix A, a copy of the matrix A. If I, if I try to visualize this a little bit, this is going to be very simple. It's going to be the matrix of all ones plus a diagonal matrix, which has the P1 prime all the way with Pn prime. And then I have my, my synaptic matrix A. Hmm? These are all n by n. Very simple, right? What did we assume about this matrix here? We assume that each phi i prime, let's, let's for now assume that they're differentiable. So I'm gonna not worry about the, the points where I lose differentiability. They can be handled later on. It turns out you don't have to worry about them at all, in fact. We assume that independently of the value of xi, in fact, yeah, this is upper bounded by zero and lower bounded by zero because it's weakly increasing and upper bounded by one because it's non-expansive or it's it's uh, it, it's it's slope restricted hmm? between zero and one now um all right all right all right hmm? so now we've done the first step. What's the second step? Let's just write one more equation here. So now I am interested in calculating the supremum over X. So X takes arbitrary values in Rn um, of, and by the way, notice that the input U appears only there. And it actually plays essentially no role because it appears only here and it doesn't matter what x i here. This should have been a x plus u i at entry. Doesn't matter at all, right? Because I'm just going to use the bounds zero and one. So u has disappeared for all intent and purposes in the context of this firing rate model. So don't don't be surprised because here we had for all u. But if I'm just going to assume that my activation function is between zero and one, then u doesn't play any role. All right, so mu, notice that I have not yet decided what norm am I going to use. And now I have d f f r of x comma u. And I would argue that this is upper bounded by the max of mu of minus identity plus let me introduce an arbitrary vector d, which takes values between zero and one to the end. I will put square brackets and then a there. Let me remind you, whenever I write something like that, right, square bracket of d is just a diagonal matrix, d1, d2, all the way to the end. Does that make sense? Diagonal. I just like, like it a little bit shorter. So I write, write square parentheses around it. Okay? Why did I switch from this P primes to that D? Why did I do that? Because here, this, this Jacobian of P depends upon X and U, and it may take value between zero and one. So now here, I'm just saying, I'm going to worry about, I'm gonna imagine that this Jacobian takes all possible values between zero and one. Um, uh, this, this, this diagonal matrix, each, each of the entries on this diagonal, and I'm going to call that di. And the reason I have it less than or equal to is because potentially here, I just said that I am between zero and one, but potentially maybe I have a function that is never equal to a derivative equal to 
0 0.5, for example. But, but here is that I allow that, right? So, so this is a greater than or equal to because I am, I am maximizing this function over a larger domain. So if you're looking for the maximum of a function, if you enlarge the domain, the maximum can only increase. It cannot decrease. I have an optimization problem, the a function over a domain. If I enlarge the domain, of course the function, the worst case can only become worse. The maximum value can only, if I shrink the domain, the maximum may decrease, but if I enlarge the domain, it can only increase. Okay, so the advantage of this formula is that I've eliminated the states. I just now need to work with this D. These lowercase d's are essentially the, the, the angular coefficients that your activation functions can take. And right now I'm assuming they can take any value between zero and one, each of them. So you understand, I hope you understand this symbol. Zero, one is the interval between zero, one. When I write it to the n, what do I mean now? That's the hypercube in n dimensions. In each dimension, you go between zero and one. Hmm? Okay, now, what do we have here? We are looking to compute the worst case value of the log norm over, oops, a collection of matrices, right? What does this collection of matrices look like as a function of D? D changes, when D changes, I have many matrices. This is a linear function of D. And D takes value in a hypercube. So it turns out that this is gonna be a polytope of matrices here. I have a polytope of matrices. It's still a convex set because the hypercube is convex. It's a convex set. And then if I, if I apply an affine transformation, right? Because for each D, I, I multiply by the synaptic matrix. I subtract the identity. It's an affine transformation um, from the set of matrices D to the set of matrices minus identity plus square root DA. Uh, it, it's going to be a convex set. It's going to be a polytope in the set of matrices. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I hope you remember that we said that the log norm is convex because that's going to come in handy very, very soon. Let me go back to the study. Now I switched back to chapter two, more or less precisely where we uh, stopped during the lecture yesterday. Is there a question? Pardon me? The edges, almost, almost, yes. There is a guess uh, uh, already about the next step. Let me just quickly remind you, I think it was a little bit earlier than here too, the, the fact that we, we, um, we had a slide, right? That we reviewed during the last lecture where we discussed the fact that induced matrix norm for the discrete time problems and induced log norms for the continuous time problem have both the property of having subadditive and homogeneous with respect to positive numbers. You can positive. Therefore, um, it, together, these two properties imply these convexity properties. So if you have for the induced norm, uh, you look at the induced norm of theta A plus one minus theta B, it's upper bounded by theta of the induced norm of A plus one minus theta induced norm of B. And the same is true for, for the log norm. So that's the classical equation for convexity. Perfect. Why does this matter? Why, why are we interested in this matter? Because we have a convex polytope of matrices that I am illustrating in this picture here. We have a convex function and we are looking to maximize a convex function over a convex polytope. Where is the maximum value achieved? Is it achieved in the interior? The minimum of a convex function could be achieved in the interior, but the maximum of a convex function is never achieved in the interior of a convex set. Uh, the one dimensional picture is something like that. Imagine that I have a convex set in one dimension is an interval. 
Hmm? I have this interval and I have a convex function. A convex function could be like, like that. That's an idea of a convex function. But then do you see that the maximum is achieved at one of the two uh, vertices, right? By the way, here's another, another example of a convex function. A convex function could be like that. That's fine. I still have this point here. And I have that point there. So the maximum is achieved on the boundary. But even more than the boundary, if you think some more about, about the two-dimensional problem or higher dimension, the maximum must be achieved at one of the vertices. Hmm? Potentially, if the function is flat, it's achieved uh, along the entire segment of the polytope. But generically, it's achieved at one of the vertices hmm, of the polytope. Question. Concave. The concave function. Now, here we have convex. So the, the norm is a convex function. The, the induced norm of a matrix is a convex function of the entries of the matrix. Hmm? And the entries of our matrix minus identity plus diagonal D times A for the firing rate models, those entries depend in an affine way upon the D coefficients. So therefore, it's a combination of a convex function with an affine function, which is known to be, again, convex. Yeah? All right, perfect. So in general, in general, one could define a convex polytope to be um, anything that looks like that. So what is this formula here I'm writing? I'm saying, in general, I could have, this is, an, a, a, this is a linear equation. You could say, I have the vertices. The vertices are a i um, a one through a m. We'll, we'll think about what the vertices are in our case of the firing rate in a minute. But let's suppose you have some number of vertices m. Then it's true, always true, that the convex polytope is a convex combination of the vertices. Hmm? Any convex set that is a poly defined by vertices, you know, it's going to have to be a convex combination. What's a convex combination? It's a linear combination where the coefficients are non-negative and they sum to one. Hmm? Convex combination. And what I just discussed for you, it's the relatively obvious fact that any convex function over a polytope achieves its maximum value at one of the vertices. Hmm? Perfect. So what I've wrote here is that no matter which A you select, mu of A is upper bounded by that particular mu of AJ. Hmm? Of course, uh, this is an upper bound, but then that upper bound is achieved. It's not that the function is upper bounded by a value and maybe I don't achieve that value. No, that value is at one of the vertices. So of course you achieve it. You achieve it at one of the vertices. All right, perfect, perfect. Now, we just said that we have this vector D, which takes value in zero, one to the N. That's the hypercube. And here I have drawn the hypercube for you. This is the origin, right? And there is a minimum point zero, and there's a maximum point in the hypercube where every entry is equal to one. Hmm? Every other vertex, every other vertex, I don't know, this vertex will be of the form something like one, zero, one, one, doesn't matter. If this is in three dimension. I, I wrote something that has four entries. It doesn't matter, right? Some number, some combinations of ones and zeros. All right, fine. Now, we were dealing for the, for F firing rate, our polytope was of the form minus identity plus D times A, right? That's the polytope of matrices. We were looking to compute mu of minus identity plus D A. And now is the time where I would like to mention one more property. This is called the translation property of the log norm. This quantity is always equal to mu, well, this is this is just because this is the identity matrix. Huh? This is equal to minus one plus mu of d a. Hmm? So you can if you have in fact you could have you could have even a, even a parameter gamma there. If you had a gamma there, it would be here. Okay, 
The translation probability is only true when you sum the identity matrix or the scalar multiple of the identity. If it's an arbitrary matrix, it's not true. It is not true that mu of A plus B is equal to mu of A plus mu of B. It's less than equal, that's a subadditivity property. But if A is gamma times identity, then it is true. That's a special case. All right. So, okay, so the minus one, we move it aside because we cannot optimize. It's minus one. Even if I take the supremum over D, it doesn't matter, right? The minus one will just come out. So really the task that we have is we wish to compute the maximum value of this particular polytope, the polytope of matrices of the form DA, where, well, I should say diagonal D times A, where D is the hypercube. Okay, so the game is open. Now the task is what is the best estimate for the contraction rate that we can get as a function of the norm that we choose? Hmm? So in other words, how small can you make, how small can you make mu, no, the max under D of mu of DA as a function of, you know, whatever is here, the norm, what norm are you using? I am going to start by telling you the answer for the one norm, infinity norm. Then we're going to do the, the case where I choose the, I choose weights in the one and infinity norm, and I design the optimal weights in the one and infinity norms. And then I'm going to show you how you do this. Well, maybe not today for the two norm. Uh, and how do you carefully do the calculation so that you obtain the tightest possible, right? You know, here, I don't want to just have something loose. I want to have something as tight as possible. Hmm? Questions? All right. I think I've spoken 45 minutes. So maybe it's a good moment to take a, a couple of minute break. Let's start again in three minutes. I'm, as usual, I'm going to leave the camera and the microphone on. See you at uh, 3 or 3. Uh, European time.
All right. So um, let's slowly um, start again. Um, would it make sense to turn on the lights? Okay. So um, after all the theory that we have done in the last uh, in the last two lectures, we are now confronted with our first computational problem. Essentially, how do I do this computation? Hmm? So uh, let me make one more comment before I continue. Um, if we are working in Rn, so we have a neural network with n neurons and states, then the hypercube 0, 1 to the n has 2 to the n vertices. 2 to the n vertices. So this is you know, scary because and we'll, we will want n to be very large. We are not interested in studying systems with two or three neurons. Uh, in reality, in machine learning applications, people are talking about using very large model sizes. Hmm? Certainly, we've run simulations in, in my group with a thousand variables. Hmm? So now, um, essentially, we know that the worst case value is achieved at one of the two to the n vertices. And therefore, we could just simply compute the value of the function at two to the n vertices and find the largest one. That's always possible. Highly undesirable, but possible. Is there a question? No, I think that would have been the last thing to go to the But there is an important L1 over L2, it's usually Yes. Yeah. Are you're asking me the relative bound between log norms there are similar there are such results in chapter two which i would like to show you but perhaps they're not relevant right now for this particular task because uh, i understand we are choosing the best one that, that's right ultimately we will compare the norms um, but um, right now we're just trying to put the optimal value I can get um, using uh, one and one or infinity norms. So, all right. So once again, uh, the task is I could evaluate my function at two to the n vertices, but that would be you know undesirable, and I want to be able to do it with a with a amount of computation that does not. Uh, become unbearable, right? So before we jump into the details, let me uh, remind you of the formulas because by now you may have forgotten them. So these are the formulas that we saw during the first lecture that tell you what are the expressions for the log norms with respect to the one and infinity norm. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, we will work with two, but, but not right now. So what are they? Well, um, they are, um, uh, let's work with the infinity norm for a second. It's, it's a row, remember the word row, it's a row sum, but it has this feature that the off diagonal entries uh, are taken absolute value of. So they're, they're normalized like that. Perfect. So now um, let's do this job. So we just said that, um, I need to take, so let's do an analysis right now. Let's do it together. And I, I need to close the door. This is very distracting. So thank you. It, it, all right. So um, let me read these formulas. Let's read them slowly together. We do have our matrix polytope. We want to compute. This is, oh, sorry, I, I thought I was going to do it for the infinity norm. I'm doing it for the one norm. All right, let's go back. So for the one norm, it's column sum. All right, it's the same. It's not a big deal, right? Um, and I have to take the maximum value with respect to D. Okay, let's do it one step at a time. So max D is unchanged. Now I plug in the formula uh, by definition, right? So we just said max column sum. Okay, so um, I could even do it like this. I could even uh, do this, uh, put it in a new window. 
Um, I have the formula for mu one right there. I expand it, there it is. Okay, so I need to get here on the right, I have A, I, J. On the left here, I have to have A, I, J. So the I, sorry, the J, J entry, the J, J entry of this matrix. The J, J entry of that matrix is D, J, A, J, J. Because it's like the uh, multiply the first matrix by the second, and uh, the first matrix is this DJJ. So this is just writing matrix products in components, hmm? nothing, nothing more than that. And then I need to do, as, as you see here on the right, right? I need to do the row sum, sorry, the column sum with the absolute value. Okay, so it's the absolute value of uh, what would be AIJ, but now on the left, the matrix AIJ is DA. So I have DI times the absolute value of A, AIJ. I don't take absolute value of the i because the, the, the coefficients d are between zero and one. So the, you don't need to worry about that. Okay. All right. I will not need this formula on the right-hand side any longer for a little while. So let's maybe even close it. All right, fine. So now what happens next? What happens next is that, um, well, I'm reminding myself that dj is between zero and one. Now, if you look at just the first term, just the first term. What is an upper bound on that first term? If AJJ is positive, then the first term is upper bounded by AJJ. On the other hand, if AJJ is negative, now you have a negative number multiplied by a number between zero and one, the worst case is zero. Hmm? So you don't see anything there, it's a zero. Because again, um, yeah, this is a very simple concept that, you know, the max with respect to, let's change variable for simplicity, gamma between zero and one of gamma times AJJ, it's equal to either AJJ if AJJ is positive or zero if AJJ is negative, right? Because I, I just maximize that quantity. The other term is this term here. How do I upper bound that term? Well, I keep the sum, I keep the sum. I keep the absolute value of AIJ and I upper bound the I by its maximum value, which is one. Hmm? So notice that in going from the first row to the second, I have eliminated D. There's no more D now. Hmm? I have there was this D, D was taking two to the N values. I've eliminated that, it's gone. Hmm? It's an upper bound for now. Hmm? So now what do I do? Now I have an if clause. In, in a sense, I have an if clause. It's either this or that, right? There are two cases. You know what? But then each, the, the first term and the first row and the second row are both upper bounded by what? by the maximum of the first row and the second row. Does that make sense? Of course, right? If, if it's either A or B, A or B are upper bounded by the maximum of A and B necessarily. Now, what are those two quantities equal to? Hmm? Here, there's a little step, I'm not gonna worry. Now, the first term, this first term, well, but that's exactly, that's exactly mu one. That's exactly mu one of A. It's also true because here, to get to the first row, I, I substituted dj with one and di with one for all i, which basically means that the first bound was obtained for d equal to one n, the maximum vertex of the hypercube. Hmm? The, how did I achieve the other term? How did I achieve the other? The other term had d j equal to zero and d i equal to one for all i different from j, right? That's the way I obtain the other bound. And, and, I, and I, I need to do that for the maximum value of j. So it turns out that, um, here I'm just gonna skip a, a detail, it's, it's not important that if you re-go through these calculations with another with another fine comb and you think again about this max and means and the di and the dj, you see that 
This second term here, the one that I am highlighting, happens to be achieved by mu one of, when I write I n Hadamard product A, I mean to say the matrix with entries A11, A22, oops, A22 all the way through A and N and zeros everywhere else. So the pardon me? Thank you. Element wise, Hadamar, yes, yes, element wise. Uh, um, or entry wise. Yes. So another way to put it is when I write A minus I N A, this is the matrix A with zeros on the diagonal. A, A12, A13, A21, A23, and so forth. It's, it's a matrix when you set the main diagonal to zero. It's really not a big deal. Moreover, even though I'm not showing it to you in detail, in fact, the thing that I really care is that this is really the same as mu of, there exists a certain D star A. That's the key point, actually. In fact, this particular expression, I don't care all that much. What I care to mention right now is that if you go through the derivation, you can see that there exists a D star such that this is true. Why do I care about this? Because basically, I have now shown that the maximum value of the log norm on this polytope is, is upper bounded by, because I've used upper bound, right? By the value of mu one at two particular vertices, the maximum vertice and this D star vertex, which, which is gonna be of the form ones everywhere, except at one place that would be a zero. But then, but then this is not an upper bound. This is actually equal to that because these two particular values are values that the function does achieve. It achieves them at those two vertices. This is the proof that if I go back to my lemma here, I have now proved that, I skipped a, I skipped a step, but I proved that the maximum value is achieved, um, is equal at, at those, all those two values, at those two points, right? Does that make sense? Now, instead of having two to the end vertices, I have only two. I have only two vertices. Um, just to show you briefly um, the other case, let's do it for the infinity norm. It's even a little bit easier for the infinity norm. For the infinity norm, um, Yes, yes, it's the D star at which uh, this mu one norm is maximized. You don't even need to know which one it is. It's just you, 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 um, this formula is correct. And uh, uh, well, okay, to compute this formula, you need to com compose this matrix and feed it into a piece of MATLAB or Python code. And the MATLAB or Python code needs to take the maximum rho sum. And when it does the maximum rho sum, it, maximum column sum, when it does the maximum column sum, it'll have to choose the column with the maximum sum. Yeah. Right, right. So remember, this was column sums, and these are row sums. Hmm? So the second case, the infinity norm case, it's even it's the same style of proof, even a little bit simpler. It works like this. Now that you get the gist, let me be a little bit a tiny bit faster. So suppose I were to just do the absolute row sum of A, and I use this you know bold R, bold lowercase R, to do the absolute row sum. By absolute row sum, I mean the diagonal entry is, is AII. I don't take the absolute value. And then I take the absolute value of the off-diagonal function. Now, when I do DA, then I scale DA like that, all right? But it turns out that the absolute row sum of DA is just the lowercase d that multiplies RI. Hmm? This, this time I'm doing absolute row sums, not absolute column sets. 
And so I can just use the rows of A. And now what happens is that, again, I do worst case scenario analysis. <laughs> By definition, it's the maximum under D of the maximum under I of these weighted row sums. And now what happens? Well, two things happen. First of all, these N functions, because I have the maximum under D and I have, I have the maximum of N functions, but these functions are decoupled. And what that means is that this, I can exchange the order of the max. And when I bring this outside max inside, it only depends upon lowercase di, because the ith function here depends upon only one of the di's, not all of the di's. So now I have n decoupled optimization problems of the same type as before. I'm computing the maximum value of di ri with respect to di. Again, if ri is positive, the maximum is ri. If ri is negative, the maximum is zero. Same, same little simple optimization problem. And so then, uh, when now I have a, a, a max of an if clause. If this, this, if or, right? But then this is upper bounded by the maximum of the two rows. One row is zero and the other is max ri. But max ri is equal to mu infinity of a and the max of zero is zero. Mm -hmm. And finally, let me, let me add one more formula. That's equal, that entire thing equal to the max of mu infinity of one n a comma mu infinity of zero n a. Here by zero n, I mean to say the zero with n entries, right? And because mu of zero is zero, and now these two are precisely two vertices of my polytope, the smallest and the largest, which now means again, that even though I started with this function and I did upper bounds, it's not an upper bound because the function does achieve those values. In summary, as you have seen, what have we seen? We have seen that for the firing rate model, I can re relatively easily compute the value of the log norm of the Jacobian, the worst case over all possible angular coefficients of the activation functions. Okay, with respect to one and infinity norm. So let me go back to the firing rate problem. So now we are back with our neural network that we, we started the lecture with. I want to make sure that these neural networks are strongly contracting so that they have all of those problems. Let us now look at the proof. To, I wanna make sure that I get a behavior like this. It has a unique equilibrium point, all trajectories converge to it, and there are level sets for the Lyapunov functions that we talked about the other day. Hmm? Question. It, it will be strongly contracting as soon as I make the right as it's it's uh, it, it really means it, it's it's it means it means what's illustrated in this picture it means that any two trajectories are coming closer together it means that there exists a unique equilibrium point it has multiple the apple of functions and it's robust to disturbances delays and so on and so forth all of the properties that I discussed during the first lecture will apply to this model of the firing rate, provided I can show what I'm about to show. So let me finish this proof and then I make the statement. So remember what we wanted to do is talk about this one-sided Lipschitz constant of the, um, of the uh, firing rate model, which is the supremum over X of mu of the Jacobian. I did the calculations by hand for what the Jacobian looked like. And then I transcribed it into a maximization problem over D. This I did a few, I did you know, an hour ago. Over the last half an hour, 
I have, for example, if we select the infinity norm, I've just hopefully convinced you of, if I would use the infinity norm, then this is the, this max, which is just one of the two pieces, right? That was minus one plus the max. Now the max with respect to the infinity norm is the max of zero and mu infinity of A. By the way, the max between zero and an object is the rel function. People also write it as mu, you, you know, if, if I write, if I write X plus, people sometimes mean zero if X is negative and then X if X is greater than or equal to zero. That's the subscript plus means this. Okay, so I'm gonna be wondering when is it true that this quantity, I need this quantity to be less than zero, right? All right, so here's what the theorem says. The theorem says is, okay, take a firing rate model, FR, right? With the synaptic matrix A. It doesn't matter the input, it doesn't matter the biases, they're irrelevant. This system is strongly infinitesimally contracting. Well, okay, with respect to the infinity norm, if, um, if the maximum between two, is two quantities is less than one, because I had minus one plus that, and I want that to be less than zero. So I bring the minus one to the other side. By the way, this is obviously equal to, well, this is obviously the same as asking mu infinity of A less than one, obviously, because if that's less than one, then zero is certainly less than one, so fine. And what's the contraction rate? The contraction rate is exactly one minus the maximum of those two things. Hmm? Moreover, if I change norm, if I use the one norm, we did those calculations as well. Now I had mu one of A and mu one of A minus its main diagonal. And I want that to be less than one. Hmm? Remember the one comes from the fact that if I write my, my ODE for, well, if I write the vector field for FR, it's minus X plus phi of A X plus U. So the, the minus one comes always from this. This is really, that's the dissipative term that, that is always helpful. Mm? That gives you the minus one. If I had had a, a minus gamma, now I would have had a gamma here, right? Just carry that through. All right. So provided my synaptic matrix has this feature, the matrix itself has log norm, one log norm less than one. And even when I subtract the main diagonal, the main log norm is less than one, then I am contracting with respect to the one norm with the rate, which is the gap between one and those quantities. Hmm? Any questions? Okay. So this is the first calculations that you've seen where I was able to carry all the way through and work this once compute out this one-sided Lipschitz constant with respect to one or infinity, which are very simple, very simple norms. Okay. Now. So we are looking at what you are asking. Now we have a condition of a new form, and which is related to the weights. Mm -hmm. So is there a relation between the new weight and the whole? Ah, right. Um, yeah, let's, let's, I think I may have it a little bit here. The topology of the not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. Oh, okay. um, let, let's do that. Let's take mu infinity of a less than one. Let's look at what that means, right? What does that mean? And again, I am I finding myself desiring to go back to the formulas so that you guys can see them multiple times and they can begin to sink in and you may begin to remember them. So we are doing the infinity norm. So we have rho absolute sums. When is it true the mu infinity of A is less than one? 
And let's do it on this page, actually. When is that true? Well, mu infinity is the maximum of a collection of numbers. So the maximum is less than one if and only if each number is less than one, right? Because, you know, all right. So this means that, let's move this to the left. This means that a i i plus the sum under j different from i, a i j is less than one. So that's the condition. This must hold for each i. All right. So um, if I were to have a certain topology, let me try to draw it. I have an old i here. I have. Okay. Let's actually um, let's think about one more thing. So when I write x i dot equal to minus x i plus p i of the sum under j of a i j x j plus u i. So what is the interpretation of a i j here? This is the edge that carries the, that carries the, elect let's say electrical information from j into i, right? So a i j is the strength of the synaptic connection carrying the electricity from j to i. Hmm? All right, so I'm going to draw it like this, right? I have, I have, I have an A, I, I, and then I have other connections. This could be A, I, J, this could be A, I, K, and so forth. Hmm? So this is saying that the self loop, the, the self synapse, um, plus the sum of the strengths of all incoming connection, absolute value. So it doesn't matter if it's a plus or a minus, if it's an excitatory or inhibitory connections, it's irrelevant. All of that must be less than one. So there is an upper bound on how strong these connections may be. Now, it could be, oftentimes it may well be, that AII is maybe negative. Hmm? Uh, maybe there is a self, self repression, or maybe AII is zero. Let, let's imagine for a second that AII is zero because I already have I already have the dissipation in the firing rate model, right? F firing rate of X comma U is minus X. I already have some self dissipation. So imagine AII is zero. Okay, that simply means that the, the strength of all of the incoming connections is upper bounded by one. The fact it's one, the fact that it is one, the number one is a consequence of the fact that we have this very simplified model. I wrote x dot equal to minus x plus. So here there will be time scales, this would be a gamma there. So there will be some coefficients that would describe the uh, the parameters of your neural network. It's just that I had normalized everything, so I end up with the number one. Hmm? The, that's right. There's some gain here, which is less than one. There's a potential similarity here. Each neuron has to have the feature that the strength of the incoming connection is upper bounded by a certain number, by, by one for this normalized case. Okay. All right. We have done another 30 minutes. Let me, I don't wanna drive you crazy with details, but let me, let me ask an important question. The important question is the following. Okay, so I, we now have this test and we also have a nice interpretation for it. Hmm? The incoming connections. By the way, the other, the other new one of A, this will have to do with the strength of the outgoing connections. Hmm? So the, the strength of the outgoing connections bounded by one will be fine as well. But yesterday when I did my class, I spent a little bit of time doing matrix theory, if you remember. And at some point in time, I drew you a Venn, a Venn diagram, which described, which described Oops, sorry, it's taking a while, but I will find it, I promise. Here it is. I drew this diagram yesterday. I was describing for you 
various stability notions for our matrices, for our uh, for our matrix that describes our system. The, essentially, the matrix that describes our system is minus identity plus A, A being the synaptic matrix. Because remember, the minus identity came out of the log norm that gave us the minus one. I can bring it back in if I want. So essentially, I need to take log norm of minus identity plus A. So the matrix that we're really playing with is minus identity plus A. And now you could ask me the question, okay, Francesco, you have, you have this uh, mu, let, let me write it in red, mu infinity of A less than one. Or, or equivalently mu infinity of minus identity plus A less than zero. It's exactly the same. Hmm? Um, what does that correspond to? It turns out that this corresponds to uh, a, a, basically it's a minus identity plus A. It means that um, the matrix is diagonally dominant. You know what diagonally dominant means? It means that the enters on the diagonal are larger than the sum of the absolute values of the row uh, of the or the column, forget now I'm confused, uh, of the row or column. It's either row diagonally dominant, or column diagonally dominant. You take the absolute value of the off diagonal entries, you sum them up. So it turns out that I am sorry to report to you that if you are diagonally dominant like that with a negative diagonal entry, then you are here. Let's just say negative diagonally dominant. I say negative because the diagonal entry has to be negative and in magnitude, it has to be larger than the row or column size. Does that make sense? Perfect. 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 So now the name of the game is, okay, we've been able to give a closed form test, foolproof, everything is clear. Very low, very low computational complexity, like elementary. Now, can we go from this smaller set to this larger set? I would like to, can you handle matrices that are metzler hurwitz or Lyapunov diagonally Hurwitz? metzler hurwitz let me remind you, it means that alpha, the spectral assessor of, it would be minus identity plus A, Metzler upper bound is less than zero. Can you do that? So here, it's a little bit of a long story. Let me just tell you the answer. The answer is, oops, sorry, it's on a different page. I need to go back to my um, uh, page on the uh, neural net, on the neural network. The answer is yes, I can. So here's just a statement of the theorem. Imagine that um, alpha of the Metzler majorant of the synaptic matrix is less than one. This is the same. This is the same as saying that alpha of minus identity, yeah, minus identity plus a. Metzler majorant is less than one. Why is that the same? It's the same because when you do the Metzler majorant, uh, you only touch the off diagonal entries. You take the absolute value of the off diagonal entries. And when you're computing the eigenvalues of a matrix and you subtract from the matrix the identity, then the eigenvalues are just shifting by the value one, mm -hmm. you know that, right? So if I have if I have a matrix B, which has an eigenvalue lambda, so B is B equal to lambda B, if I apply minus identity plus B to V, well, it's minus one plus lambda B. So the eigenvalue is just shifting. You translate the matrix by a scalar multiple of the identity, the eigenvalues are just shifting. Mm -hmm. So here, this other than my typo, these two conditions are the same. You're either asking for the spectral assessor of the Metzler major to be less than one, or you're asking for the spectral assessor of the Metzler major of the whole matrix, minus density plus A, to be less than zero. So this is a Hurwitzness condition, right? And this is saying that minus identity plus A is Metzler Hurwitz, using the language that I introduced yesterday. 
Now, when that's the case, you can show that your system is strongly infinitesimally contracting with the rate, which is the gap between one and alpha, and this same alpha here. There is a plus here, meaning to say, even if your system is incredibly Hurwitz stable, everything is very much to the left, you cannot do that. It can only be, in any case, there's a plus here, just like there was a plus essentially here. And what is the norm? The norm with respect to which you achieve this contractivity is a weighted infinity norm. So it's the infinity norm with respect to a certain uh, 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 positive vector. Hmm? So this is good news because I have extended a set of matrices with respect to which I am contracting. And now you should ask me the question, well, Francesco, um, how do you compute that eta? And how do you do this proof? All right, so let me uh, just spend two more minutes and then we take a break. I'm not, I, don't, I don't have a desire to do that in detail, but I wanna tell you where, how do you understand this? Where is this? How do you prove that? And so here's the point. The point is that this is now a game of matrices. It's a, it's a, it's a linear algebra game. We're just trying to optimize that cost function with linear algebra. And when I uh, uh, describe for you the content of the linear algebra chapter, chapter two, chapter two is a very long chapter. It has a lot of tricks. There is a bag of tricks that you can apply for any problem. Mm -hmm. And um, specifically, there is a collection of tricks that has to do with how do you optimally design a norm. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways to solve various types of problems. But what is true is that the Messler majorant is a Messler matrix. Mm -hmm. And there are tools that are specific for Messler matrices. Mm -hmm. So allow me to show you this lemma in a couple of minutes, which tells you how do you design an optimal weighted norm for a Messler matrix? What does an optimal norm? It means that if I have a Messler matrix M, remember in our case, the Messler matrix M is the Messler majorant of minus identity plus the synaptic matrix, right? That's true, right? That's what we are. We're trying to compute as negative as possible a log norm for this matrix. Hmm? I'm just going to call it M for Metzler, and I'm going to erase this part here so we don't have to drive ourselves crazy with all those symbols, right? Okay, I have a Metzler matrix M. Um, here it is, a Metzler matrix M. Hmm? So, as you recall, when I discussed this, I reminded you of the fact that there is a theory of Perron Frobenius that applies to both non-negative matrices and Metzler matrices. This theory says that, the, for example, it says that if I have a Metzler matrix, and let's say it's Hurwitz, it says that the eigenvalue the spectrum must be something like that, and it has a dominant eigenvalue for a Metzler matrix. That dominant eigenvalue comes with uh, non-negative dominant eigenvectors. Moreover, if the matrix is irreducible, meaning to say the graph associated to the matrix is a directed graph and it's irreducible. So from every neuron, you can travel to every other neuron following the directions of the edges. Let's suppose that's true for a second. It's not necessary, but it simplifies things. Then, the left and right dominant eigenvector. Okay, so once again, I have M. There is a right eigenvector corresponding to the lambda. So this eigenvector, this eigenvalue, there is lambda, it's the dominant eigenvalue. So V is the right dominant eigenvector. Whenever you have a right eigenvector, you guys know there also exists a left eigenvector. This is, this is well known, right? For every, eigen, for every eigenvalue, there's a right eigenvector and a left eigenvector. Both of them, for a Metzler irreducible matrices, both of them are strictly positive. Hmm? 
So they have N strictly positive vectors. This is related for those of you who know it. If you are if you are studying Markov chains that are irreducible and they have a stationary distribution, the stationary distribution is well known to be strictly positive. Hmm? Strictly positive. So this is the same story. Both eigenvectors here. In the Markov chain case, you have a, a, a total. Believe me, it's, it's really the same. So now it turns out that um, if you, um, it turns out that I am looking for log norm of m equal to alpha of m for some for some norm here. So I can find an optimal norm such that the log norm is identical to the spectral system. In general, I told you spectral CISA is upper bounded by the log norm. But in this case, the gap is zero. Why? Because Metzler matrices have a lot of structure. They have a lot of properties because of the properties of the Ferron Frobenius theorem, essentially because of the properties of the second vectors and that, that, that exist. In fact, what's truly remarkable about this little result is that if you give me any P, which is one, two, infinity, any P norm for any P norm, I do the following. First of all, if you're given a P norm and you find the dual norm Q, so the LQ norm is dual to the LP norm whenever one plus P, sorry, one over P plus one over Q is equal to one with the convention that if p is infinity then q is is one and vice versa and then i define a set of weights eta that are just the coefficients of the two eigenvectors divided by each other so it's w1 divided by v1 w2 divided by v2 wn divided by vn notice that this would not make sense if the eigen eigenvectors had negative entries or entries equal to zero, but they're positive. So I'm not dividing by zero. And I didn't say it, but of course, I need to take pth root and qth root of the denominator, pth root of the numerator. So what's the theorem? Thank you for, for saying that. Yes, yes, they're absolutely normalized to sum to one. Well, um, actually, the answer is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter because when I do, remember when I do mu r of a, this is mu of r a r inverse, similarity transformation. And so mu r of a is equal to mu of two r of a. It's the same. It doesn't matter. It does. If you if you if you consider weighted norms, the weight it's always scaled. It does. It doesn't matter. Um, so the result is that p comma eta. Um, so what do I mean by this? This is the p norm, and I use as weight the diagonal matrix defined by that eta that I just defined for you. Hmm? So that's eta. So let's go back to the, to the let's let's let me not change the slide. Remember, 10 minutes ago I said for the firing rate model, I can prove strong infinitesimal contractivity with respect to a weighted infinity norm, provided the synaptic matrix, well, minus identity plus the synaptic matrix is Metzler coordinates. And I used an eta to, to say what is the weight for that infinity norm. The weta, the eta comes out of this particular lemma entitled optimal diagonally weighted norm for non-negative and Metzler matrices. So this result is essentially a known extension to the peron frobenius theorem. It's, it's, it's a bit tricky. The proof is, is not very difficult of this lemma. And it's about the fact that you are designing an optimal norm you are designing all right let me take a break now it's 347 we'll start again at 352 
Posso togliere questo? Ah, posso Posso rendere questo? Sì. 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 Guarda, mi trovo, mi trovo veramente spesso a vedere il comando di un di un di di Grazie. <laughs> Grazie. 
Okay. So, all right so now um let's um let me just show you one thing let's just reason a tiny bit about what we just did um just want to uh no pardon me, that's not the right slide um what have we done what have we done so what we have what we have done is um we've said that we have needed to worry about this parameter d in some set okay let me write it in zero one to the n um we have our beautiful notion of log norm of the jacobian which tells you how contracting are your are your solutions and you want the worst case contraction be negative right so, so this is mu uh maybe we're using infinity norm maybe of the jacobian and we've been able to calculate this and show that it was less than equal than some negative number so this is the first thing we did we used the infinity norm we just guessed it right we, we did it for both one and infinity but i didn't have a reason to do that i just blurbed it out all right what did we do later later we said oh, okay i am willing to use a weight here hmm? If I am willing to use a weight, eta is a vector of positive entries, and square parenthesis eta is a diagonal matrix, right? And the definition of a of a weighted uh, norm uh, is uh, is just mu of r a r inverse. If eta is a, if if r is a diagonal matrix, that's just essentially mu of eta a. It's just it's very simple. It's just eta a eta inverse mu of that. And what that means is that you basically scale, multiply rows and columns by, by eta and eta inverse. It's, it's very easy. But then what did we do? Then we said, you know what? I can optimize eta. And basically taking the inf over all eta. Actually, let me write it better. Inf over eta uh, which is a positive vector right it's just write it like that each entry of eta is strictly positive mm -hmm. what by the way why do i have max and then i have inf i have max because this is a compact set bounded closed of a continuous function because uh, the log norm is continuous in the argument it's actually convex so it's certainly continuous so i have a Continuous function over a compact set, it achieves the max. So use max. Why do I use inf here? I use inf here because eta is a positive vector. So that's an open set. That's an open set in eta, right? Because positive means I, I do not allow eta greater than or equal to it. That would be a closed set, but then it doesn't work because I cannot use. Uh, weights that, that have some entries equal to zero because then my norm is not a norm it becomes a semi-norm and on top of that here this inverse doesn't make sense anymore if i have some entries equal to zero right so there's no good mm -hmm. okay so this type of formula is pretty standard the concept is that uh well this entire quantity here no this entire quantity here is the one-sided Lipschitz constant of ffr Mm -hmm. and i optimize that i which is to say I minimize because i want the one side ellipsis constant to be as 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 small as negative as possible mm -hmm. if it's negative the larger it is 
I get a larger contraction rate and the larger contraction rate is, is a robustness margin. It tells you the rate, you know, it, it's, a, it's a rate of convergence. So you're happy, you want it to be as negative as possible. So in other words, sometimes we will define OS lib of, of, a, of a vector field F to be, and let me look, leave some space on purpose, is the supremum over X of the mu of the Jacobian F, um, uh, right? Which this is actually, let me do it better. Um, mu TFX, something like that. But what we've said right now is that we're going to typically optimize over some weights and the R ends up there. Hmm? So we choose the weights to minimize the one satellite constant so that is as negative as possible, hmm? ideally below zero, at least. Otherwise, it's not a contracting system. All right. Now, let me go back to my. So um, I have shown to you how uh, we are able to. Um, to uh, look at, uh, remember there was this set of, uh, like I, I, should have, I should have selected it. Now I suffer some more. Where is that? Okay. So first we did the infinity norm, and then we were able to enlarge the set of matrices that we can handle by going to matrices that are metzler coordinates. Hmm? Let me leave it at this for now, but I will say, maybe tomorrow I'll have time to elaborate, that in some cases, we can go to the larger set, the Lyapunov diagonal in coordinates matrices. That's very desirable. Hmm? Um, and we'll, we'll try that tomorrow in, in, with a different, uh, very recent results that allows you to do that in some cases. And I'll, I'll mention that tomorrow. But that's the name of the game. Research-wise is try to use as few assumptions as possible on the set of matrices that you can that you can that you can use. But let's go back for a second to our motivating problem. To start with the motivating problem was this one, right? We had artificial and biological networks. Biological networks are implicit or recurrent. In fact, as I think I mentioned to you uh, earlier, one could even try to use machine learning. One could try to use recurrent and implicit models, even in machine learning applications. Hmm? And we have now given conditions in such a way that precisely these level sets, the infinity norm, these are infinity norm level sets centered around X star. These are level sets of the Lyapunov function. So every time you enter that set, you don't go outside anymore. Hmm? because they're level sub for nested level sets. And the Lyapunov function is decreasing exponentially fast. On top of that, I'm gonna point your attention to the fact that here, very subtle in my graphics is that if you look at this thickness here, it becomes increasingly thin there. That's because the other Lyapunov function is the norm of F. Hmm? The infinity norm of that. Uh, along the flow, it's decreasing exponentially fast. Hmm? So, all right, fine. Now, I would like to use the remaining 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes that I have to discuss the following problem. How do I compute this equilibrium point efficiently? Hmm? Because it could well be that I have just three nodes, not a problem. Any solver will find it. You run a simple solver in MATLAB, ODE34, it's fine. But perhaps I have a million nodes. And now I don't want to invoke an ODE solver on a million nodes. I want to have a good fast algorithm to, to do this computation. The other reason I want to do this is because I would like to introduce you a little bit into the concept that contraction theory, in, even for continuous time systems, is strongly connected with um, um, uh, computational methods, hmm, with optimization. Hmm? So let's talk a little bit about this. We have a problem in mind. I want to find the equilibrium for a continuous time system. Um, but let's just talk about connections between contraction theory and optimization. 
Um, let me start with this slide. So this slide is a highlight, high level uh, uh, reminder of the Banach contraction. Theory. We've done it yesterday in full detail. So, you know, you're fine, right? You have a map G and you need the Lipschitz constant of G to be less than one. Then G is a contraction in discrete time. And then I can use the Picard iteration which will converge geometrically fast. And yesterday I gave you three different estimates. Well, what if I give you G and the Lipschitz constant of G is greater than one? How do you do that? Well, here's one attempt. You could define something called the average iteration. Where you say, you say, okay, I want to go towards, I want to go in the direction given by G, but I'm not going to go all the way to G of XK. I'm going to, I'm at XK, I compute G of XK, but I also remain near XK. Hmm? A little bit better. I compute G of XK. The other term is XK. And then I introduce a small parameter, alpha. And I take a step in the direction of G of XK, but one minus alpha, I remain where I was. Hmm? Alpha is less than one, it's positive. So then if you look at this carefully, this is a convex combination, right? A convex combination means you have two or even a larger number of entries. They're all non-negative, they sum to one. So this is called the average iteration because you're doing an average, right? It's a little bit of this, 93% of this, 7% of that. Okay, so this is called the average iteration. So here comes a new theorem that I have not shown to you, brand new. I did claim for you uh, in my introductory, the first lecture, that there are ways, efficient ways of computing equilibria of strongly contracting systems. And here is the theorem that leads to that. This theorem, I would like to call it the infinitesimal contraction theorem because I'm not doing finite steps, I'm going to do infinitesimal contraction. The theorem says that the following three statements are equivalents. Hmm? What are the three statements? The first statement is, there exists an alpha such that the average iteration parameterized by alpha is a Banach contraction. Hmm? So we now have a situation where G is possibly not a contraction, but if I, if I slow it down, if I do this equation star, the average iteration is a slow down, right, of, of, of G, because you don't go all the way to G. You go towards G, but you stop. It, by the way, it's also called the damped iteration, because you don't go all the way, just to damp it down, right? You keep moving, but you slow down. Um, in, in, the, in the theory of monotone operators, this is also called the krasnoselsky mann iteration. All right, fine. I am curious, when is it true that my average iteration is a contraction? I want to give if and only if conditions. And the remarkable statement is that um, this is true if and only if any one of these two statements are true. And these two statements are obviously equivalent. And you know they're equivalent because, because we've studied continuous time contraction theory. And these two statements is that the dynamics minus identity plus G of X is strongly infinitesimally contracting, or equivalently, the one-sided Lipschitz constant is less than one, okay? is less than one. So I went from lip G less than one to OS lip less than one. Remember, the Lipschitz constant intuitively gives you an upper and lower bound in the derivative. The one-sided Lipschitz constant is just an upper bound. So if you have a Lipschitz constant, the one-sided is always small. The one-sided can be negative, whereas the Lipschitz constant is always positive. Hmm? The Lipschitz constant corresponds to the induced norm, and the one-sided Lipschitz constant is the induced log norm, 
And I have mentioned to you, I should show you more example that the log norm of any matrix is always upper bounded by the norm of the matrix. So this quickly implies that OS leap of any, of any operator is upper bounded by leap of the operator. Huh? So when I go from, uh, when I go from lip G to one side of lip G, it's always better. I always allow for a larger set of maps. Can I give an example of a, of a, of a map where F or of G or G is Lipschitz? G is Lipschitz. And no average iteration is contracted. Right? Well, infinity could be negative. Alpha is positive because it's a step size. Hmm? Does that make sense? Now, indeed, if you look at the ODE x dot equal to minus x plus g of x, this is minus x plus 2x. This is equal to x. This is not contracted at all. This is uh, exponentially unstable. Hmm? Does that make sense as an example of a, of a case which violates the condition? Hmm? So it's because I don't know what the power is holding, but maybe we have a subset that's basically not seeing the reason why. It's unstable. Yeah. All right, perfect. All right, so um, here I am advocating that if your system is strongly contracting, if your continuous time system is strongly contracting, you can find a, um, a solution using the average iteration. But let's think about that a little bit longer. One more second. Let's review everything from scratch. Um, I have an ODE x dot equal to f of x, and I'm trying to find an equilibrium of f, which is I'm trying to find an x star such that f of x star is equal to zero. I'm looking for an equilibrium of the ODE, which is, people write it like this. It's a very elegant form. I said, x belongs to the set of zeros of f. Um, but this is the same as saying, I define g of x to be x plus f of x. And now, whenever f is zero, um, and, and, then, and then I'm basically looking for x star such that g of x star is equal to x star. Why do I say that? Well, that, this is just a transcription because if f is zero, if I set that to zero, then I get then I get just that, that g of x star is equal to x star. So the reason I, I usually have f for the vector here, and now I have f and g because I want to make it clear that it's, it's um, we're either looking for zero of F or fixed points of G, hmm? fixed points of G. And so in this infinitesimal contraction theorem, notice that the ODE is not G, it's minus identity plus G. Hmm? 
f is equal to minus identity plus g, or equivalently, g is equal to identity plus f, right? So if I write, if I write g equal to identity plus f, this is of course entirely the same as saying f is equal to minus identity plus g. So actually there's a typo here. If I write i sub n, I mean a matrix with n entries. This is id as in the identity map, but not the same. All right. So what I was trying, what I want to mention in this slide is that when you do the average iteration of G, which is one minus alpha identity map plus alpha G, that average iteration is exactly the same as an Euler step for F. F is the ODE. So the average iteration is the for G is the Euler integration for F. It's just a translation. It's really just a translation. So why is that? Because Okay, once again, let's do it together. If f of x is equal to minus x plus g of x, now I want to do once I would like to do one step of Euler. What's one step of Euler? One step of Euler is say xk plus one is equal to xk plus alpha, open parenthesis, well, uh, 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 alpha times f at xk. Do you agree that this is the Euler step? Okay, that's the Euler step. All right, perfect. So then I plug in, right? xk plus alpha. Now I use the formula for, for f. So I get minus xk plus g of xk. Then I multiply and I collect one minus alpha xk plus alpha g of xk. Does that make sense? It's trivial, right? I mean, here I apologize. I'm, I'm, I feel guilty because I'm, I'm making you waste precious time and cycle. Why, why am I doing that? Because um, we, we, if let's go back here, the Banach contraction theorem is computing a fixed point g of x equal to x, but our task was compute f of x equal to zero, slightly different, it's a zero of the map. So, the standard, the standard concept is to relate the two by this very simple translation. Okay, so don't, don't be scared by that, it's really elementary. So uh, I hope I'm not going to get confused between zeros and fixed points, but they're 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 just a very simple translation by the identity map away from each other. So if I go back to my uh, uh, infinitesimal contraction theorem again, let me read it one more time. Uh, there exists an alpha such that the forward Euler step is a Banach contraction if and only if my dynamics strongly contracted. The dynamics being minus x minus x plus. G. Um, well, which discrete? I, I give you a continuous time system. Which discrete time system is stable? Yes, if you if that's right. Yes, if if G, uh, if F is strongly contracting or 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 one or minus identity plus G is strongly contracting. Yes. So you that the exists this Yes. Yes. So, so, what is the If if f is strongly infinitesimally contracting, when I go to g, I can always find an alpha, or even I don't need to go to g. I just apply the order the order. This is contracting. So, if you just have a trap, there always exists Yes. If you start. So if you start with G, what this slide tells you is that um, either G has Lipschitz constant less than one and you're done, or the one side that lip G is less than one, in which case the average iteration is a contraction. Hmm? So if you start with the G, you, you interpret it like this, either lip G is less than one, perfect, I use the Picard iteration. If lips G is greater than one, you cannot use the Picard iteration. You check if OS lip is less than one. 
If all sleep is less than one, then you can use the average iteration. For some alpha that I haven't told you what it is yet, this theorem says there exists an alpha. Now we need to go and find the optimal alpha. We haven't found it yet. Now, if you start with an ODE, possibly of the form minus identity plus G, then okay, then you use the forward order step. In fact, in fact, no, that's that's not completely true. If you start with an ODE, X dot equal to F of X, you just use the forward order integration and it works. With the right value of alpha, I haven't told you what alpha. I just said there exists an alpha. Hmm? Kirill, did you have a question? Okay. All right. So now, what is, so the theorem says there exists an alpha. In fact, even more, I can tell you, it's easy to see that if a certain, so this is zero, this is one. If there exists an alpha, let's say, let's call it alpha star. Alpha star, if it's a, if the iteration is a contraction, if the average iteration is a contraction of alpha star, then it's also a contraction for every value of alpha below alpha star. So it's a range of values of the star. Basically, there's an alpha max. Below, be, beyond that alpha max, it's not a contraction anymore. Mm -hmm. So what is the maximum value of alpha, such the iteration is a contraction? And separately, what is the optimal value of alpha, which may not need be the maximum. Maybe it is, maybe not. The, the optimal value of alpha, which one is that? Is the one that minimizes the contraction factor. In discrete time, the contraction factor is less than one. So you want to make it as small as possible. In, co in continuous time, the contraction rate, you want to make it as large as possible. Right? You want to go as far away from the imaginary axis as possible. But in discrete time, you go inside the unit disk as far as you can. So you want to, I want to tell you, I, I will tell you, what is the maximum value of alpha and what is the optimal value of alpha? Hmm? All right. Now, the answer depends upon the norm. So in this slide, I have the optimal, I have the answers for the case of L2. So the two norm, unweighted, two norm. Actually, I apologize, take it back. <laughs> Weighted two norm, sorry. With an, with an arbitrary positive definite matrix P. Hmm? Um, this is a classic result. It's a standard old result. And the result is the following. It works like this. Um, unfortunately, we need one more assumption. So I have a vector field F. It has a contraction rate C. So it's a vector field. So it's a one-sided Lipschitz constant is equal to minus C. I need to also assume that F is Lipschitz, not only one-sided Lipschitz, but also Lipschitz. Hmm? Now I need, a, I need a bound on both sides. And that parameter is lowercase l. So I apologize, I used l for the Lipschitz constant input to states. Right now, l is the Lipschitz constant of F with respect to X. Hmm? So it's, it's, the same, it's, it's, it's the same symbol, lowercase l, but it's a same, different interpretation. I, I probably need to, need to change notation to be consistent. Now, it turns out that people can also define the condition number. The condition number where you're playing with these two ones in the Lipschitz constant. Um, it's very similar, not identical, to the concept that whenever you have a matrix, you can define the condition number of the matrix, which is the smallest by the largest value. value. Something that tells you how well behaved is the matrix. Here is the Lipschitz constant divided by the one side of Lipschitz constant. The, uh, more accurately, the one-sided Lipschitz constant of F, it's equal to minus C. So here I'm not dividing by the one-sided Lipschitz constant, I'm dividing by minus the one-sided Lipschitz constant. And I am assuming that the one-sided Lipschitz constant is negative, otherwise it doesn't work. Huh? All right, so um, this theorem here is consistent with the infinitesimal contraction theorem that I showed you earlier. Because now, because I know that C, that the system is completely infinitesimally contracting. So now I know, I already knew that there exists an alpha such that the map, that the forward order is a contraction map with respect to the norm. I already knew that. The question is which alpha? The question is which alpha? And the result is for alpha in this range. 
Alpha has to be positive because it's equal to zero, you don't even move. And it has to be upper bounded, but twice divided by C, contraction factor, the contraction rate, times kappa squared. Now, if you want, you can also rewrite this because uh, two C, I can plug in, I get L squared over C squared. So this is uh, uh, two C over L squared. Mm -hmm. Twice the contraction rate divided by the... Um, that is right. Alpha could be greater than one, and this would still be true. If... if um, right. Yeah. right. Now, notice that here I'm defining alpha star, and it's exactly one half of this quantity. Let's call that alpha max. Hmm? So it turns out that the optimal step size that minimizes um, the contraction factor is one half of the maximum value of the step size, the, of the allowable step sizes. Actually, strictly speaking, this maximum value is not allowable because as you notice, this is an open interval. So if you use alpha equal to that value, it does not, it does not converge. It's not proof to converge. You need to, to take it a little bit small, right? So you have, a, you have an interval which is open. The maximum value is not acceptable. Epsilon inside would be. The optimal value is precisely in the middle. So you know, like yeah, fine. Yeah. All right, and, and this is the resulting contraction factor, which is guaranteed to be less than one. Now, um, where is the other result? Oh, sorry. Um, I don't have it here. Uh, all right, so um, let me... Let me just uh, tell you that, sorry, there is a slide that is missing here. So apologies, I'll just jump to the final conclusion and I will explain it there. But I have, I have a missing slide, I'll show it to you uh, tomorrow, where I give you expressions for this range and the optimal step size and the optimal contraction factor for L1, L infinity with norm, with the non-Euclidean norms, L1, L infinity, or even weighted L1, L infinity with positive weights. So let me not go look for my slides right now. I apologize, I forgot the slide. Let me just jump back all the way to the neural network problem, right? Okay, so we are back with our recurrent neural network, which is contracting, and I'm going to use the infinity norm. Remember, with the infinity norm, uh, I'm gonna switch slides right now. With the infinity norm, we had agreed that the bound was uh, log infinity log norm of a right where is it um, uh, here it is so the result that i want to point your attention to was this one uh, we had been able to calculate the uh, log norm and it had just infinite mu infinity of a and when we go back to the neural network um the sorry What we had said was that this right, the first row here, with respect to the infinity norm, I need to, it's sufficient to get new infinity of a less than one, because if new infinity of a less than one, then certainly the maximum between one and zero is less than one, right? And the gap between one and this maximum value is the C. This quantity here is C, the contraction rate for the continuous time dynamics. Okay. So in the neural network applications, what are, what are the three things you want to look for? First of all, there's the fixed point problem. Hmm? This fixed point problem is because I want to go from U to Y. I'm not writing the output equation. It's not important. And I hope to define a model which is well posed and it has a unique equilibrium. Hmm? Now, naturally associated with the static fixed point problem are two dynamics one in continuous time and one in discrete time. What are they? In continuous time, the natural dynamics is the continuous time recurrent neural network. Hmm? Again, there could be a tau here, 
there could be different time constants, coefficients, and it doesn't matter. The point is that when you set the left hand side to zero, so you, you're finding an equilibrium, this equation is identical to the one before. So it's either the, the dynamical recurrent neural network has the equilibria, which are the solution to the fixed point problem. And what is the discrete time version of this? The discrete time version of this is the average iteration of the fixed point equation. By the way, if I let this g of x, that's the average iteration of g. And the average iteration of g is the same as the forward Euler for f, where f is equal to minus, minus identity plus g, right? You see that, right? This is minus identity plus g. Okay, so here I call, I'm calling this the average iteration of g, but I could have called it the forward Euler step of f, it would have been the same, right? Here, that's the average iteration. So you're going to execute that average iteration and it will convert for what values of alpha? Okay, so first of all, in summary of everything we said today, computing the one sided Lipschitz constant of the recurrent neural network is the same as maximizing um, the supremum, right, over X and maybe even U of the log norm. And we've done the calculations, this idea of maximizing a convex function over a polytope. And then we had two to the n vertices, but really at the end of the day, the maximum value is achieved at, at one or two of those vertices. And that's the value that you get. You, you get the infinity norm, just the positive value of it, min, minus one plus that. So, so this, by the way, this formula is true always. When it is true that new infinity of, of, of uh, and I apologize, I switched to W now for the synaptic matrix instead of A, so hopefully that's okay. When it is true that each row satisfies that condition, right, that, that input gain condition, then mu infinity of, B of W is less than one. This means that this number is positive. Yes, actually, this number is negative, which means that now I'm contracting. And I am contracting with a gap, one minus that. And here I have the formula for the optimal step size with respect to the L infinity. And this is not the same formula as for the L2 norm, right? I told you that depending upon the norm, there are different expressions for the optimal step size and the optimal corresponding contraction factor of the average iteration. And the formula is, okay, it's given here. It's a bit boring. Um, you look at the smallest diagonal entry of A, I, you know, here I'm switching between W and A. So that's definitely a typo. This is supposed to be uh, the, the diagonal entry of W, okay? So it's it's my fault. I, I, I change notation inconsistently. Um, uh, this is the formula. It's uh, uh, one minus this divided by that. So the, the, uh, the numerator is the contraction factor. It is the, is the um, uh, yeah, it's, it's exactly this quantity of the numerator is the same as that. It's the contraction rate of the continuous time dynamics. And uh, sorry, I didn't say it right. Let me say it again because I'm tired right now. So this is the value for the optimal step size. And this is the value for the contraction size. Okay, right now I think we're all tired. It's been two hours and a half, including the 15 minutes fighting with my computer. All right, so the point is that um, this entire theory works through and uh, one is able to convert the continuous time problem into a discrete time problem and guarantee convergence and even optimize the rate uh, as a function of the, um, uh, you know, as the parameter, the parameters of the, of the network. Um, right. Some of the results that I've shown to you today are related, especially this last part, are related to a recent paper that we published in New Rips last year. Hmm? Um, so these slides will be available. Um, right, I, I actually think I had the formulas here. That's why I thought I had them. Uh, this was L, L1 and this is L2. Okay, sorry. So these slides will be on the website and the slide with the formula will be there. Hmm? So when we meet tomorrow, I may elaborate a little bit more on this uh, on this uh, connection between contraction theory and optimization. 
Um, and then we will look at um, we'll look at other cases of contracting systems. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Are there any questions from anybody online or here in the room? For all of you connected online, I would strongly encourage you to send an email to either me or Marco Coraggio um, um, at uninav.it. You, you can find this email on mine so that we can be in touch and I can share with you uh, YouTube links and uh, PDF, various PDFs. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. And um, yeah, let me know. Do you have any questions? I think we're all tired. All right. We'll see you all later then. Bye-bye.